Good evening. My name is Grace Hayek, and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to tonight's webinar with Northwestern University astronomer Shane Larson. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter. This is the fifth or sixth time I've had of welcoming Dr. Larson to, to GPL, and it's always a pleasure. He is a research professor of physics at Northwestern University, where he's the associate director of Sierra, which is the Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics. He works in the field of gravitational wave astrophysics, specializing in studies of compact stars, binaries, and the galaxy, with both the ground-based LIGO project, that's L-I-G-O, and future space-based observatory LISA, L-I-S-A. He grew up in Eastern Oregon and was formerly a tenured associate professor of physics at Utah State University. He's an award-winning teacher and a fellow of the American Physical Society. He contributes regularly to a public science blog at writescience.wordpress.com, and he tweets with the handle at ScienceJedi. It's so nice to see you again, Professor Larson, and I will hand the reins over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Grace. Uh, thank you uh, to the Glencoe Library and all the staff there uh, who makes these things happen. Uh, it's great to be back again. Uh, you know, I am a university professor. Um, I'm a professional astronomer or a professional physicist, uh, and I spend a lot of my time thinking about very technical things related to the topics that I talk to you about. But another big part of what I do um, is I spend a lot of time talking to people and teaching them about the science and about why we do the things we do. And sometimes that's in a classroom, like I teach here at Northwestern, and sometimes it's out in the public talking to folks folks like you. And so um, I greatly appreciate my friends and colleagues at places like Glencoe Public Library who invite me out to give these talks because it's great to be able to talk about things that are very near and dear to my heart. Um, I have been uh, several times, and each time I, I come, I you know, ask Grace, what should we talk about? And we kind of hem and haw and talk about different uh, things that we could chat about. Uh, but tonight's topic is one that I really enjoy a lot. Um, it's about wormholes and bending space and time and what that means, not in the context of astrophysical objects, although we'll mention some astrophysical objects, but really why we worry about this at all. And the reason that's very near and dear to my heart is that, um, you know, I grew up possibly like many of you, reading lots of science fiction, watching lots of science fiction, and getting around the universe is the big problem there. Okay, now we could do an entire talk about starships, and we'll talk a little bit about starships tonight, but the real truth of the matter is, is that one of the biggest challenges we face in exploring the universe is that we can't get out there. And so oftentimes we spend time, you know, devoting our attention to imagining ways that we could get out there, the ways that we could learn more than just kind of sitting here on Earth and using telescopes to probe uh, these very interesting and very far away places in the cosmos. So we're going to talk about wormholes. It's related to a topic called general relativity, which is the modern prescription that we have for gravity. Um, it's the dominant uh, way that we use to describe things like black holes. It's used in modern technology like GPS. It's the thing that I went to graduate school to get my PhD in. And so this, ap this, this uh, application to wormholes and our discussion tonight is largely rooted in what we think is possible as scientists, as opposed to the kinds of things that we hear about or think about in science fiction. As examples, as we talk about this, I'll mention things that you may have heard about in science fiction or seen in movies. Um, and I'll have some reading for you as we go along, uh, novels and things that you may uh, have or may have not been exposed to. So there will be plenty for you to follow up with uh, afterwards. And I'll, I'll certainly send that list to Grace and uh, the folks at the library as well. But if you want to read more about that, uh, there is the link to my blog right there, writescience.wordpress.com. It is a public-facing blog. There's lots of other things there than just the stuff we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, but it is meant for folks who aren't physicists. As I like to tell people, I write it so my mom knows what I do. So you can certainly read a lot about general relativity, black holes, and wormholes and stuff there. Uh, my social media handles are there, certainly, uh, as well. And if you tweet at me on Twitter, I will certainly tweet back at you. Okay? So this picture here is an artist's rendition 
of, you know, a wormhole, except that we don't really know what wormholes really would look like if we encountered them in the cosmos. As scientists, we can compute what they would look like. In general, we expect they might look very boring, but in order to simulate the imagination and kind of help us picture what it is that we're talking about, we often make these kinds of visualizations, not unlike the one that you see here. Okay, and so we will come back to why we draw this picture a little bit later, uh, but this is this is really an artist's impression and an artist's imagining of a wormhole, even though it's probably not realistic. Okay, so the beginning of this conversation, uh, like I said, is really about going somewhere besides here on Earth. And one of the kind of most important things to keep in mind, which I don't think we remember all the time, is that no human being has ever been farther away from the Earth than the moon. And in terms of cosmic distance scales, the moon is actually very, very close to us. Um, traveling at the speed of light, it's only about a second, a little bit less than a second away. Traveling via rocket, the way the Apollo astronauts did, it's about four days away. But everything else in the universe is enormously farther away compared to the moon. And so as a consequence, everything that you know about in astronomy, everything you've heard, everything you've seen in a newspaper story, everything you've read in a book, has been learned with telescopes here on Earth. OK, within the solar system, we've certainly sent spacecraft to all the planets at this point. But beyond our solar system, nothing has ever traveled. OK, so this is the beginning of why we talk about this topic. We really haven't been not even ankle deep out into the great cosmic ocean because the moon really is not that far away at all. OK, now. For most of us, right, there's what, uh, 7 billion people on the planet now. There's a very privileged few of us who ever even traveled to outer space. There's a huge barrier to traveling from the Earth to outer space. But from the perspective that we have as physicists and the perspective we have as engineers, we don't really start with how hard it is. We ask, how far away is it? If I really want to get away from Earth, how long does it take me to get to outer space? And one of our old colleagues who is no longer with us by the name of Fred Hoyle once famously remarked that outer space isn't remote at all. It's only an hour's drive away if your car could go straight upward. Okay, now obviously I think Fred uh, didn't think about uh, driving in Chicago traffic where people drive much faster than 60 miles an hour, but the statement here is based on what the definition of outer space is. Okay, so if you want to travel to outer space and earn your astronaut wings, right, the definition is you must travel above a certain altitude called the von Karman line. Okay, and that's basically the height in the atmosphere you can go to where there's not enough air left for fixed wing airplanes to fly. You absolutely have to have a rocket. And that altitude is somewhere between 50 and 70 miles overhead, which is the origin of Fred's statement here. Okay, so the beginning of outer space is only 60 miles away and we can get there and indeed humans have gotten there. Okay, but the question is, what would it take to get much farther away, okay? So what I wanna do here for the next couple of slides is I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of numbers. Now I don't normally do that in talks, but invariably there's some aspiring engineer out there in the audience. There's some science fiction uh, author who needs some numbers to write their novel about. So I wanna just give you a few numbers that we as scientists can compute very easily. Um, if you're interested in how to compute them, there will be some books and resources at the end to do it. But I just wanna give you a sense of the scale of the problem and then we'll talk Talk about ways to resolve it, one of which is, is wormholes, okay? So let's just imagine traveling through the universe in a fast car. So I'm a big movie addict, and so one of the uh, movies that I admire very much is a movie called Drowning Mona, which is, you know, posed in the town where they build Yugo cars. So I always imagine traveling through the universe in Yugo hatchbacks, okay? So no, nothing fancy, just a simple average car that can get up to 60 miles an hour. So let's imagine driving through the universe in a car, typical speeds that all of us drive every day, 60 miles an hour, or traveling in a jet. 
typical speed of about 600 miles per hour, which is the maximum speed that almost any of us ever travel in our entire lives. Okay, I have a series of destinations listed down the side there, places that it would be very interesting and fun to travel to. And let's imagine, let's compute actually, not imagine, how long it would take us to make the journey to each one of those places, either in our car or in our jumbo jet. Okay, so the closest places that we can imagine going in the cosmos are Earth orbit, where Fred Hoyle thought we could go very easily, or to the moon, the most distant places humans could be. Okay, at the speeds you and I are used to, driving in your car to get up to where the space station is will take three or four hours. Okay, but if you wanted to fly to where the space station is in a jet, it would only take about 20 minutes. Okay, now the space shuttle can go about three times faster than that. Okay, so it takes astronauts about seven to 10 minutes to get to orbit. If I wanted to go to the moon in my car, it would be a long road trip, almost five and a half months in your car. Okay, and if you could do it in a jumbo jet, it would be slower than the Apollo astronauts, but you could get it in about 16 days to the moon. Okay, about the time that an average cruise, you know, to South America or around the Caribbean might last. Okay, so the nearby universe, the time scale, even at the speeds that you and I travel around, are not unreasonable, right? You and I can imagine taking a 16 day trip. Okay, but if we want to go to the rest of the universe, the problem gets much harder. Okay, so Mars and Pluto are really the nearby universe. They're here in the solar system. Okay, but in your car, if you wanted to drive to Mars, it would take you 106 years, longer than the average lifespan of a human. Okay, so the nearest world to us is impossible to get to with the average technology that you and I are exposed to every single day. I could do it at the speeds that a jet flies, but it would take 10 years. I would have to decide in first grade that I wanted to write a report in my senior year about Mars and take off. And I would get to Mars during my senior year 10.6 years later, okay? So it's entirely possible to imagine traveling to Mars in 10 years, but our kind of perception about our lives and the time we spend doing things is impossible for us to comprehend that we would spend that much time making the journey, okay? Now we can do it in rockets much faster. Uh, rockets can send space probes to Mars and in principle can send humans to Mars and on the order of a year, but you're still investing a year of your life to go. Pluto, you can see there is much, much farther away. Uh, traveling at the speed of a car, it takes 6,900 years to get to Pluto, okay? And that is enormous in the times of even human civilization. If you go back in human civilization to 5,000 BC, that was around the time we were domesticating pigs, okay? So that's how far back in our history that amount of time is. And to get to Pluto in a car would take a long, long time. Okay, and then the rest of the universe, even here in our own Milky Way and the nearest galaxy, let alone galaxies that are farther away, the time it would take at ordinary human speeds to get there is longer than the age of the universe. Okay, so this is what we're faced with. This is why we're having this conversation. We, want, we would love to visit somewhere else in the universe, but the farther you get from Earth and just, you know, a little ways away from home, it gets very, very, very hard to get there. And so we're contemplating how can we do something about these enormous times that are involved. And there's three basic problems that you have to solve. One of them is the one we're talking about right now, the scale of the cosmos itself. It's enormous. The second problem, and these problems are not all unrelated, the second problem is me and you, humans themselves, is we not only do we have to be sustained, do we have to be able to live and, you know, have candy bars and water and Netflix and all those things that we feel like we need to survive, right? But our lives are very short. And so the scale of the universe, in addition to our needs, makes traveling to outer space very, very hard. 
And then the last thing there, propulsion, this is really what wormholes is ultimately trying to get at, or one of the things it's trying to get at. Propulsion is a gigantic technology problem. You have to have something to make you go. Okay, so getting from one end of the universe to the other is all about how are you pushing yourself? How are you pushing your rocket? Okay. Now, all of these problems, none of these are beyond the scale of the laws of physics to solve. We actually, there's nothing in the laws of physics that precludes us from traveling to the stars and doing it within a human lifetime. The engineering will be complicated and difficult, but there's nothing that says we can't discover, we can't invent, or we can't build propulsion capable of sending us to the stars fast enough and within a human lifetime. So let me give you a couple more numbers, and then we'll we'll decide that that's going to be impossible and talk about wormholes. Okay, so the question is, if I want to go someplace and get there before I die, I have to go fast. So how do you go fast? Well, traveling in rockets or starships, going fast is exactly the same problem as going fast in your car. All you have to do is hold down the accelerator pedal and you don't let up. You just accelerate and you continue to accelerate. Okay. So in our everyday life, right, the kind of average acceleration is the first column there, zero to 60 miles per hour in five seconds. Okay, so most of us don't do that, but if you go listen to people talk about their sports cars, that's the kind of thing that they do. They stomp on that accelerator and they start going fast really, really quick. And the question is, if you don't let up, how, how quickly will you go even faster? The second number there is listed as 1G, okay? And that is a number we use a lot when we talk about star travel because that is an acceleration that if your rocket were pushing with you at that speed, you would feel like the same forces that you feel sitting in your chair right here on Earth, like you are right now, listening to me give this talk. So 1G means one Earth gravity, that much force. And so we often think of that in the context of rockets and starships, because for humans to live, that's a comfortable speed for us to be accelerating under. It'll just feel like life here on Earth all the time. And in fact, there's been lots of science fiction written about people in starships traveling at 1G and not realizing they live in starships, right? So it's it's kind of the, 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 the kind of de facto standard, let's say, okay? Now, uh, this is a great example, this 1G here, for those of you who are fans of The Expanse, Okay, so this is a uh, science fiction series by James Corey, uh, and it's also a, um, uh, a, a series on, I think they're on Amazon now. Uh, so in the Expanse, they have this thing called the reactionless drive. And what that drive is, is it is a 1G drive. And that's why they can get around the solar system at the speeds that they talk about, because that 1G acceleration is actually pretty good. Okay. Okay, so down the side here, I have listed a couple of speeds. These are all listed in fractions of C, where C is physicist shorthand for the speed of light. Okay, and we will talk about this in a moment. Some of you may remember that the speed of light is the ultimate speed in the universe. So when we talk about traveling around the universe, we talk about how fast are we going compared to the speed of light. 1%, 5%, 10%, 25%, or 50% the speed of light. OK, and if I just fill out that table, this is an exercise that you can do. Um, how long does it take you to get to those fractions of the speed of light at zero to 60 in five seconds acceleration, just stomping on your Corvette's accelerator or at one G, not unlike the reactionless drive in the expanse? And what you see is down there at the bottom at half the speed of light, if you want your ultimate speed to be half the speed of light, it will only take your Corvette 267 days to get going that fast. Or if you have a reactionless drive like you do from the expanse and you're accelerating at 1G, it will only take you 146 days to get going at half the speed of light. So this is why, as you know, as a physicist, we don't worry about the fact that we have to go fast to get around the universe. It's entirely possible to get going to substantive fractions of the speed of light. The problem 
is physics does get in the way for reasons that are not related to getting to go this fast, but that are related to the way the universe behaves at those speeds. And then the second problem yeah. is engineering. And, you know, engineering can be solved uh, almost always by application of money and lots of engineers' brains. Okay. So what's the physics obstacle here? Well, the physics obstacle, as many physics obstacles, starts with Albert Einstein. So this is Einstein when he was a very young man. Uh, this was at the time in uh, 1904, 1905, when he was working as a patent clerk in Switzerland, in Bern. Okay, so uh, this jacket, this tweed jacket he was wearing is apparently the uniform of the uh, Swiss Patent Office. It's apparently tweed green, if you could see it in color. Um, and so I, I've always been impressed that there's a picture of Einstein wearing this uh, uniform when he was working in the Swiss Patent Office. And one of my friends reminded me, yeah, but this is just like your mom taking a picture of you the first time you get your Wendy's uniform, right? So, so this is just the uniform he wore at his, you know, one of his early jobs when he was a very young man. Now, while he was working as a Swiss patent clerk, he, uh, he had a remarkable year in terms of the developments of modern physics because he didn't have, you know, streaming video and Spotify and all those things that we have those days. And so in the evenings, he would work on physics to entertain himself. And in 1905, when he was working at the patent office, he wrote five really remarkable papers that completely transformed the face of modern physics and basically created much of the world that we have today. So physicists called this the miracle year, the Annus Mirabilis. Uh, and uh, one of those papers in 1905 was for something that we call special relativity. OK, special relativity is a description of the laws of physics and how they behave when you are traveling close to the speed of light. And those of you who have read a lot about Einstein or kind of tinkered with modern physics, you have read probably a lot of things about special relativity. It uh, hurts your brain a lot to think about special relativity because even though the universe works this way, it doesn't seem familiar based on the speeds of Volkswagens and baseballs. Okay, but there are an enormous number of predictions that for more than a century now have been tested over and over again and born out, okay? And for our discussion tonight, there's only one part of this that we need, and that is what happens as I measure time as I begin to go faster and faster uh, and closer and closer to the speed of light, okay? And so there's a very special effect that we have in physics called time dilation. Okay, so I'm not going to derive time dilation for you. I'm not going to give you any formulas, but I'm going to tell you what the effect of time dilation is, okay? So time dilation says that if I'm traveling at any speed besides zero, any clock I'm carrying with me ticks slower. And as I travel faster and faster and get closer and closer to the speed of light, the clocks tick even slower. Okay, so as we say in the game, moving clocks run slow. Okay, and the emphasis there is in the last bit of that sentence, this happens to all clocks. It doesn't matter if you're talking about grandfather clocks with pendulums and hands that move around. It doesn't matter if you're talking about wristwatches or digital clocks. It doesn't matter if you're talking about metronomes, heartbeats, or even clocks like your biological clock that affects how your body ages. All clocks, all processes that depend on time go slower when those systems are in motion. Your grandfather clock will tick slower. Your wristwatch will count off the hours slower. The metronome will tick slower. Your heartbeat will tick slower. Your cells will age more slowly. Time dilation means that if you have any clock of any of these sorts on a fast starship, it will count out less time than a identical clock left behind on planet Earth that's not moving, okay? So this was the thing that Einstein taught us, and it, it hurt everyone's brains, including physicists, right when we started, and uh, it, uh, it has been tested over and over again, and it's true. It is built into modern technology. You absolutely have to account for it with things like the GPS on your phone, because if you don't, you will not be able to successfully navigate to your 
to your favorite coffee shop. OK, it's really kind of critically important and, in fact, uh, relevant in your everyday life. OK, so what does this mean for our traveling around the universe? So this is the last set of numbers I'll show you. OK, so time dilation makes clocks tick slower. OK, and what that means is if I go fast enough, I can reach anywhere in the universe I want to before I die. Now, many science fiction novels bypass this. They ignore special relativity and they, they just kind of come up with, you know, clever ways, hyperspace, warp drives, whatever, to get around uh, this, this kind of time dilation problem. But notably, there are many uh, science fiction uh, renditions which pay attention to it. And probably the most famous of these is this uh, book by Joe Haldeman called The Forever War. Uh, many of you may be familiar with a series of books by Orson Scott Card called Ender's Game. Uh, and then lastly, those of you who are movie buffs, uh, if you pay attention, they give you enough information to do all the calculations uh, in the movie Avatar, which is actually set around uh, Alpha Centauri. OK, so so what I'm about to show you is kind of out there in some science fiction, but a lot of science fiction kind of avoids it as well. OK, so let's imagine a trip to Alpha Centauri, the closest star to the sun, or a trip to the center of the Milky Way, which traveling at the speed of light would take 24,000 years to accomplish. Okay, What special relativity tells us, what time dilation allows, is that it is possible for me to travel to Alpha Centauri or to travel to the center of the Milky Way in less than a human lifetime. Okay. So if I just fill out the whole table here all at once, let's focus on uh, this very uh, beginning number here, 0.1c. At 10% the speed of light, it would take me almost 43 years to get to Alpha Centauri. Okay, that makes sense. Alpha Centauri is four light years away. I'm going at one-tenth the speed it takes light to get there. So it should take me about 43 years. And indeed, that's true. Similarly, for the center of the Milky Way, it's 24,000 light years away at a tenth the speed of light, then it should take me roughly 10 times that, which is 240,000 years. Okay, but the bottom number there, 0.9c, 90% the speed of light, you can see time dilation taking its effect. Instead of taking uh, four years, which is how long it takes light to get there, for me standing on the starship, just counting off the days on the calendar on my iPhone, it only takes two years to make the journey to Alpha Centauri at 90% the speed of light. I still can't get to the center of the Milky Way. It's still almost 12,000 years. But if I just keep holding on the accelerator and I get closer and closer and closer to the speed of light. I can never get to 100% the speed of light, but I can go to 0.9999, as many nines as you want the speed of light. The numbers begin to change dramatically. And in fact, if I could get to that bottom row there, 0.999999C, 99.9999% the speed of light, I can get to Alpha Centauri objectively in 2.2 days the time it takes you to ride Amtrak from Chicago to Seattle. Traveling to another star, special relativity is completely okay with, and it will only seem like a train ride across the country. Similarly, I can travel to the center of the Milky Way at that speed, and it will take only a third of my life. If I had started on that journey the day I graduated from high school, I would be giving this talk right now at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, okay? And that's cool if you want to travel and see the universe. It's completely possible within, within the laws of physics. But there's a consequence. This is what you measure on your watch. But for everyone else left behind, time is passing normally. It may only take me objectively 2.2 days to get from the sun to Alpha Centauri, but 4.3 years will still pass on Earth. It may objectively only take me 34 years to get to the center of the Milky Way, but 24,000 years will have passed on Earth. I may have said goodbye to you and promised you that I'll come back and give a talk at Glencoe Library about what I saw at Alpha Centauri, but by the time I get there, it will be four years 
from now, as far as any of you staying here in Glencoe are concerned. Okay, so this is this is the consequence. Physics allows it, but there's a penalty. You can't do it without penalty. So those of us who think about starship travel, this is where we are. So what's a poor cosmic traveler to do? Okay, so instead of thinking about pushing ourselves and building better technology, let's imagine what we can do to exploit the nature of the universe. In order to do that, in order to wrap our brains around that, I want you to think about a two-dimensional surface, a piece of graph paper that we have some ants who are walking around on. Okay, so these ants are going to go about their everyday lives. Their universe is this entire piece of paper, and they would like to explore distant places in the universe. And every ant has taken geometry, just like me and you, and they learned something when they were in geometry, which is the easiest way to get to wherever you want in the universe is to travel in a straight line. And so the blue and the green and the red ant are all like, man, I want to know what's over there on that side of the graph paper universe. And they walk in a straight line. Now, some ants are rather curious, and so they do meandering lines, right? They're kind of like, you know, our children when they are out running about and playing. They can wander here and they wander there, and they kind of travel along these, you know, radically curved lines. And that is not the most efficient way to get from one side of the universe to the other. Okay, so this is really about the fact that if you want to go somewhere, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Okay, now that's true for a piece of paper. And that statement, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, is absolutely true always mathematically for acceptable definitions of straight lines. Okay, and this is what physicists have to say about this topic, is the shortest distance between two points is always a straight line. I just have to figure out what a straight line is. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's still think about our ants, but let's imagine ants walking around on space time. And if I watch this uh, black ant, he looks like my meandering child ant from the last page. It looks like he was trying to walk in a straight line, but he got distracted and he started curving a little to the left and then he curved to the little right. And, you know, he's just wandering around, you know, enjoying his exploration of space and time. Okay. But if I watch many ants and I look at their paths, what I begin to notice is that none of them actually walk on what you and I think of as a straight line, okay? It doesn't look like something I could lay my ruler on. But if I see enough of these ant patterns, what I can discern is that there is something about the universe that they're walking on that influences the shape of the paths they take. And if I measure all those paths and I, I detect them and I map them out, I can ultimately determine what the shape of the universe that the ants are walking on is. And in this case, it is a champagne bottle, okay? A champagne bottle is not flat like a piece of paper. Nevertheless, mathematically, in the idea of physicists and mathematicians, there are pathways across the champagne bottle that represent the shortest distance between any two points. And those paths mathematically are equivalent to what you and I would call a straight line on a piece of paper. And so as travelers, as, as people imagining traveling through the universe, we ask ourselves, is there a way for us to discover short distances through space and time, which has interesting shapes like this, which get us from one place in the universe to another quicker? Are there interesting pathways that we can find in the universe because the universe is shaped somehow funny, not like a piece of graph paper, perhaps more interestingly shaped like a champagne bottle? Okay. Now, the person responsible for this thinking is, again, Einstein. Okay, I told you at the beginning that I study something called general relativity. And general relativity is about how do you think about gravity in this context, in the idea that what you and I perceive to be gravity is actually the universe forcing us all to travel on certain lines. 
Okay. So what we say in the game then is nature knows how to bend the universe. It knows how to bend space and time. And those of you who remember back to your high school or your college physics class, you may remember having to work out the problem of what does an orbit around a star look like? You know, you calculate the orbit of the moon or you calculate the orbit of the earth around the sun. And we draw these elliptical circles as we call them. Okay, and the way you learn to do that in, in physics is one way to do it, but Einstein taught us how to do the same calculation using the bending of space and time. And taking that idea to heart, we then ask ourselves, well, maybe there are ways to bend space and time into shorter pathways through the universe. Okay, and that is the origin of the idea of a wormhole. Okay, now this is a classic picture of the way physicists like me will draw a wormhole if you walk into my office and talk to me about this and we, we draw it on my whiteboard. Okay, we can't draw multi-dimensional things very easily. So we imagine the universe is a flat piece of paper. Okay, so that's this white grid that you can see here. Just like that piece of graph paper that we had the ants walking on. And if I fold that piece of graph paper into a U shape, OK, and an ant wants to walk across that grid. It can walk along the U shape, just like this long white comet here, and travel in what used to be called a straight line. But if the universe were somehow clever, it is entirely possible to connect two points on opposite sides of the paper with a tunnel, which is what you see drawn here in the middle. And this tunnel is what we call a wormhole. Its name comes from imagining the surface is not a piece of paper. The surface is an apple. And if you want to get from one side of the apple to the other, you can walk along the skin of the apple, or you can take the hole that a worm has drilled through the core of the apple from one side of the apple to the other. That's where that language comes from. OK? So these kinds of wormholes where I could go the long way around and follow this white line, or I can go the short way around, just jump through the wormhole and come out the other side, which is a much shorter distance to travel, right? The distance you travel is just how many squares did you have to cross to get from one place to the other. The distance through the wormhole is shorter, therefore quicker than taking the long way around the universe, okay? So we call these kinds of wormholes that you could jump into traversable wormholes. OK, wormholes that I can make a journey through. And for a long, long time, physicists are like, it would be great if these, these, these things exist because I can draw pictures like this. OK, but that doesn't mean they exist. Nature isn't obliged to have any kind of bonkers thing we imagine be true. OK, but we have resolved that issue because in the 1980s, our good friend Carl Sagan wanted to write a science fiction novel. And Carl, as was his way, he didn't want to cheat on the laws of physics. He wanted to have a science fiction travel, a uh, science fiction uh, novel where traveling to the stars was possible, but within the boundaries of the laws of physics as we knew them. And he knew all about time dilation. He could work all that out, but he didn't want it to be a consequence. And so he went to Kip Thorne, who's a colleague of ours. Uh, Kip uh, studies general relativity, just like I do. And he asked Kip, he said, is there some way to do this? Is there some way that, that it's possible? And Kip's like, well, we've never worked this out, but we've been thinking about this wormhole thing and maybe it is possible. So let me go work on it and we'll, we'll let you know, okay? Now, some of you may know the novel that Carl was working on is Contact. So this, uh, this central uh, technology in Contact is a traversable wormhole. And for those of you who haven't read it, there's a spectacular movie with Jodie Foster uh, and Matthew McConaughey that you, can, that you can watch, okay? Now, I wouldn't be telling you this story if Kip had not worked it out, and indeed Kip did work it out. And he wrote a very famous paper published in 1987 with a student of his named Michael Morris, okay? So modern wormholes, as physicists think of them, it are what we call Morris and Thorne wormholes after Michael and Kip's paper here. Okay, now this is, for those of you who have never looked at a scientific paper, this is the sort of thing I stare at every day in my office, right? It's a title, it's the authors, it's where they're from. And then there's this kind of short summary of the paper that we call the abstract. 
Okay, and there's some, you know, it's readable, there's some technical stuff here, but I want to point to two specific things in the abstract here, which is why I, um, why I'm showing it to you. The first thing here is right in the very first paragraph. It says the description touches base with Carl's novel Contact, which unlike most science fiction novels, treats travel in a manner that accords with the best of 1986 knowledge of the laws of physics. Okay, and that's what I was just telling you. Carl didn't want to violate the laws of physics in any way that we knew was obviously violating the laws of physics. Now, the reason I think that statement is important because all this stuff about wormholes is still true today in the 2023 knowledge of the laws of physics. In all the intervening years, 27 years, since this paper was written, we have not discovered anything that precludes the existence of these wormholes. Okay, so what was written then is still true today. Okay. The last thing I will point to is this thing down here. Um, they've been talking about the things that worry physicists when we imagine making these things, something called the energy conditions. But, but what, what Kip says is, is what I just said. It is not possible today, even today in 2023, to rule out firmly the existence of the material needed to make a wormhole. Quantum field theory, quantum theory as we call it, gives tantalizing hints that such material might, in fact, be possible. Okay, and that was really the crux of the game. Does nature have what it takes to make a wormhole? Possibly. We don't know any reason why it can't. And in fact, we have some knowledge of quantum theory that says maybe it's possible. And, and the essential plot device for Carl is, could you technologically manipulate such material? Okay. And what Kip is saying here, and Kip and Michael are saying here, is that we don't, we don't know of any reason why. Okay. And I would say that's still true today in 2023. Okay. Now, wormholes have been exploited in, in a great, great number since then. Uh, probably the most famous example, if there's any trekkers out there in the audience, is in Deep Space Nine. The whole premise of Deep Space Nine is that the space station is situated outside a stable wormhole, a stable traversable wormhole that connects the far side of the galaxy to our side of the galaxy. Uh, the movie Interstellar, uh, which many of you may have seen, Kip was actually a science advisor on. Uh, the movie Interstellar, the central transport device in Interstellar, is indeed a wormhole. Okay. Uh, those of you who have read, uh, there are two novels by Greg Bear called Eon and Eternity about this artifact that arrives at Earth and at the core of the artifact is a wormhole. Okay, so that's a great novel. And again, those of you who are fans of The Expanse, uh, the whole beginning of The Expanse is about the protomolecule building the ring gates, which are the entryways to wormholes. Okay. So wormholes in science fiction are something that people often latch on to precisely because they are within the boundaries of the laws of physics and you can kind of use them without feeling like you're cheating the laws of physics, right? I can jump through a wormhole and get all the way to the other side of the universe without the consequences of special relativity making it impossible for me to come home for dinner and tell you about all the stuff I saw on the far side of the galaxy, okay? Wormhole travel makes that possible. Okay. Now, once you decide wormholes are possible, you begin to ask yourself, well, if I can bend space and time and make a wormhole, maybe there are other things I could do to bend space and time. And there has been uh, in, in science fiction for a long time, uh, the concept of something called a warp drive. Okay. I don't know why, Gene Roddenberry originally used the phrase warp drive in Star Trek, but it's actually a very proper name for this physics effect that I'm about to tell you about, okay? So this was worked out by a colleague of ours, Miguel Acubieri. He's a professor now at UNAM in Mexico City. Uh, and in 1994, he worked out using the basic same kind of thinking that goes into uh, wormholes, how you could build a starship which would have a warp field, a distortion of space and time around it, that would allow it to travel from one side of the universe to the other without all of those pesky time dilation effects, okay? And the key to this, you can see right here in this picture, is that the space around the starship has an ordinary grid, okay? What that means is that space around the starship 
is just like that flat piece of graph paper that our ants were walking on when I first started talking to you about this, right? In those kinds of spaces where things are flat, all the consequences of special relativity aren't happening because the universe thinks you're not traveling at any speed at all. The key to the warp field is that you distort the space-time outside the warp bubble around your ship, okay? And you basically do two things. You compress space-time in front of you, so you can see space-time getting squeezed into a small space in front of the starship, and then you expand space-time behind you, so you can see it swelling up and getting bigger behind you. And the consequence of this is that space-time around your bubble looks very much like a tidal wave on the shore of the ocean. Imagine your warp bubble is a little surfboard and behind you there's an enormous wave building and in front of you all the water is disappearing. And the net result is that wave pushes your surfboard forward through space-time, through the universe. But because your surfboard is flat, you don't experience the space-time dilation. OK, so this is a very clever and as near as we can tell, perfectly acceptable way to get around the time dilation and travel through the universe within the laws of physics. OK, now the difficulty is you still need some of that weird stuff that Kip and Michael were talking about to uh, build wormholes. You need, as we call it in physics, exotic matter. And the problem with that exotic matter is we don't know what it is, first of all, that's the real problem. Uh, but we don't, we can't keep it on the starship. In order to bend space and time this way, it has to be out around the outside edges of your warp bubble. And so again, this is primarily an engineering problem. And those of you who have seen kind of people thinking about this and you know, engineers thinking about this, this is why all the starships that you see built around the Alcubierre principle have these kind of ring-shaped drive sections because you have to kind of keep the exotic matter in this ring around your starship, okay? But if you could do it, you can compress that space-time in front of you, you can expand it behind you, and you can surf your way across the universe. OK, so there's one other way that we think about a lot that you can use to get yourself around the universe. OK, and that involves the fact that the universe, as you and I know it, may not be just four dimensional. OK, so four dimensions means I have spatial dimensions. I can go front and back. That's one direction. I can go left and right. That's two dimensions. I can go up and down. That's three dimensions. And I can travel through time. That's four dimensions. But there are tantalizing hints and tantalizing ideas that maybe the universe has more dimensions, that you and I, like our ants walking around on our piece of graph paper, uh, are confined to live in the four I just described. But maybe there are fifth dimensions or sixth dimensions. And maybe it's possible that while you and I are confined to walk on the graph paper, which really should be four-dimensional graph paper, if I could somehow travel in that higher dimension, I could step off of the graph paper, I could lift an ant off of the graph paper and move it to the other side of the graph paper. I could travel through the higher dimension, take a shortcut, and bypass the long journey it takes to go through the four dimensions that you and I know, okay? Now, this is a very old idea. It's an idea that just in my career in physics has become more prominent, largely having to do with the development of string theory and particle physics and the ideas that there may be higher dimensions. But it was in fact written in science fiction a long time ago. And many of us will remember fondly the book A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Engel. And uh, right there, just 50 pages into the book, the uh, three witches are describing to Meg and Charles Wallace and Calvin what it's like for them to travel. And you can see right there, Mrs. What's It says to Meg, you think of space in only three dimensions, left, right, forward, back, up, down, but we travel in the fifth dimension. OK, and that's that big jump that we're talking about. Instead of traveling in three dimensions along the green arrow there, the Mrs. What's it, Mrs. Who's it, and Mrs. I can't remember the third witch's name, travels along the orange arrow through the fifth dimension. 
Okay. So those of you who are big fans of the Time Quartet, uh, you can go right there. And I, I always, I always remember this so vividly from when I was eight or nine when I read this. Is this is the first book I had ever, first novel I'd ever written where there was actually a picture. But this picture that Mrs. Uh, what's it shows here of this ant crawling across a string is exactly the the idea that you should have in your head. Okay. Now, there are, of course, ideas for there to be in tunnels in other ways. Probably the most prominent of these is the idea that black holes may not indeed be gigantic crushing machines. Maybe instead, when you fall into a black hole, they are, in fact, tunnels to other wares. Okay. Now, that idea is one that we've known about for a long, long time. Okay. And so you will often hear people say that black holes may be tunnels to other places. And I put a star there uh, to remind me that that is true mathematically, right? If I write down the complete mathematical description of a black hole, both inside and out, it looks like for some black holes, there may be tunnels to other where on the inside. But we have no way of testing that idea because by definition, a black hole is an object which if you fall into it, you cannot escape from because you have to travel faster than the speed of light and you can't travel faster than the speed of light. So the only way to validate whether or not a black hole is a tunnel to another place is to jump in and see if you come out somewhere else. Okay, And that's not, uh, that's not something very many of us want to, want to try and do. OK, but there are a multitude of black holes that you hear about. Um, perfectly spherical black holes are called sword shield black holes. Those are not tunnels to other places, right? If you really want to have a black hole be a tunnel to another place, you have to do one of two things. One thing is you can put electric charge on it. OK, so the stuff you get out of a socket when you stick a fork in it, electricity, if you could pipe that out of your socket and throw it onto a black hole, Mathematically, the effect of having that charge is it turns the inside of a black hole, possibly, into a tunnel to some other where. We don't know where it is. It may be our universe. It may be some other universe. It may be someplace where the laws of physics aren't quite the same as what you and I experience. We don't know. Mathematically, it exists, but we don't know what's there because we've never seen it. Okay? The other thing you can do is you can spin a black hole. And this is really important because actually every black hole that we expect in nature is supposed to be a spinning black hole. Okay, so if there are tunnels to other wares inside black holes, then virtually every black hole in the universe could be one of these tunnels to somewhere else. Whether or not those tunnels are open whether or not they are closed by nature somehow, whether or not they're traversable, those are all questions we don't have the answers to. But mathematically, the tunnels exist. Nature hasn't shown us anything to tell us that they may not. And so indeed, this has been exploited. Uh, many of you may remember this movie from when we were kids, Disney's The Black Hole. Uh, lots, of, lots of astrophysicists really despise this movie, but I actually kind of like it, mostly because while there's a lot that's not true about what we think about black holes in this movie, there's a lot that we think may be true. It gets right that the forces around the black hole are bad and are strong and can tear you apart. It gets right this idea that maybe there's a tunnel through the center of a black hole. We just don't know. Okay. But perhaps more famously, many of you may have remembered uh, Interstellar, again, starring uh, Matthew McConaughey. And uh, this is uh, uh, the movie that Kip was advisor on is they they wholesale embrace that idea that maybe a black hole is a tunnel to somewhere else. Okay. And uh, as always, there's nothing in the laws of physics to preclude that, but but maybe it's true. Okay. And so this is this is kind of the theme over and over again that we've come to tonight uh, with everything we've talked about, right? There's nothing in the laws of physics that precludes any of this. It means it's all possible. Okay, but we don't have any real easy way to do it, to test it, um, or to actually journey to one of these places to find out if it's really true. Okay, so, so that's really where I want to leave you with, right? There's many possibilities that may allow unconditional travel through the universe that would let you and I make field trips to the far side of the galaxy as easily as we make a field trip to the Adler Planetarium, okay? 
Um, and, you know, it's only as we mature in our understanding of the laws of nature, and as we begin to understand the astrophysics of some of these objects, like black holes, possibly of wormholes, if we can find examples of them in telescopes, that we may build a deeper understanding of what we currently understand, which may very well be in, incomplete. Okay, and that deeper understanding may show us that there are impediments that may prevent us from traveling, or there may be other space-time phenomena that we haven't thought of, or that maybe, perhaps, any of this is entirely likely and possible. Okay? So, for those of you who would like to read some more, uh, probably the best book about this is the one up there in the upper left. This is Black Holes and Time Warps by Kip Thorne. Uh, Kip won a public science writing award for that book. Uh, and so there's a lot in there about relativity. There's a lot in there about black holes, but there's a whole bunch in there about wormholes as well. So I think that's probably one of the best books. Uh, those of you who are interested in starship travel, like proper engineering of starships, the Starflight Handbook there by uh, Eugene Malov and Gregory Matloff, that is absolutely, I think, the best book I have ever seen about this. It has collected together in one place all the kind of serious ideas that we have about building different starships starships. Uh, it's written in prose that you can read. And then for those of you who are technically minded, they've kind of separated off some of the math into, into boxes. So you can do some tinkering calculations, write Python codes, whatever you want to do uh, to practice or imagine what it'd be like to build a starship in your backyard. Okay. And then lastly, uh, this book here, this is another book by Kip, but he wrote a book when uh, Interstellar came out called The Science of Interstellar. And he talks about all sorts of things in there, the black hole, the inside of the black hole, the wormholes, the blight, all of that stuff in the movie. And what I really appreciate about this book um, is that each chapter where he discusses one of these scientific topics, what he also does is makes his personal assessment as a professional scientist, how likely he, he thinks it is that we truly understand the science that they put into the movie. Are there things we may still discover? Is it likely to be true? Is it likely to be disproved in the future, right? So he makes that kind of assessment. And so it makes it really an interesting book to read because I think he very effectively captured what we as scientists think um, about all of this stuff, right? Okay, so uh, that's all I'm going to say about wormholes. Let me leave you with one last thing, which is all of you may have heard about the comet that is visible now. Um, so for the next few nights for this week, if it happens to be clear, and I haven't been outside yet tonight, so I don't know, um, you may be able to see the comet if you can get away from the city lights, okay? So it is not a terribly bright comet for those of us who are here in the urban skies, but if you have a pair of binoculars, you might be able to see it, and especially if you have a friend with a telescope, you may be able to see it as well. Um, right now, it's traveling almost kind of overhead. Uh, the Little Dipper is right here under where the words are. This constellation over here is the Big Dipper, which you can actually see from Chicago. But it's kind of traveling through the sky, getting closer and closer to overhead. You can see the moon right here. So tonight, it's kind of between the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia. Uh, and you, you, uh, you might be able to see it with a pair of binoculars if you're in Chicago. Certainly, if you get out... Uh, of the city, you can certainly see it. But you will begin to see lots and lots of pictures of, uh, of the comet. Uh, so this is one taken by Nick Lake, who is uh, one of our colleagues down at the Adler Planetarium. Uh, he took this actually from Chicago. Um, and you, the comet, as you've, you've probably heard, is this very green color which has to do with the gases and dust uh, that are in the comet. It will not look green to your eye, but for uh, those of you who dabble in astrophotography and stuff, the color comes out very readily um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the coma of the comet, as we say. Okay, I have a whole talk about comets that I can come and give you all sometime. But uh, for that, uh, I'll end there. And I'll say certainly thank you so much for your attention and I'll hand it back over to Grace and I can take questions for as long as you want to chat. Um, comments? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll talk about comments next time. It's done. <laughs> cool. Um, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I'm positive I'm not the only person who's sort of going, whoa. It's um, supposed to melt your brain, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which leads me to the first question that somebody asked, um, which is a really good question. Um, 
how long did it take you to really understand general relativity? Because yeah, people's minds just can't go there. Yeah. Um, so 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 general relative. So if you go to my blog um, over in the word cloud of tags, there'll be a link that says GR Centennial. Okay. So we just passed through the hundred year anniversary of general relativity, and I spent about twelve posts trying to explain it from beginning to end in a way that hopefully is understandable to people, right? But but the hardest thing about it, um, so, so there's easy things about it and there's hard things about it. The easy thing about it is that very, very, in a very real way, the ideas of general relativity are all about this picture, that motion in the universe, you don't have to think about it necessarily in the context of math. You don't have to think about it in the context of forces. You don't have to draw vectors. You don't have to do any of that stuff. If you could imagine a surface like the one that I've drawn here and imagine what an object does as it tries to move across the surface, this ellipse, this orbit of this ball on this curved dip is more or less exactly what a planet does as it orbits the sun. When you go to the mall and they have one of those big gravity wells that you roll quarters around, right? That's this picture. And it, it very intuitively captures what we mean by the, by, by the description that general relativity uses to think about the universe. We're basically describing motion by imagining you're, you're, you have to stay on this surface and you can't go anywhere that this surface doesn't tell you to go. And so, so intuitively, it becomes very easy to convince yourself what might happen. Computing the exact shape of the circle or exactly how much space-time is bent, that's hard, right? That takes a little bit of mathematical effort. But, but, it's, but it's not so impossible that undergraduates can't work with me on this stuff here, here at Northwestern, right? So um, it, it takes a little bit of math. But, but it's doable. And I think, I like to think that it's intuitive to understand if you think of it in the context of pictures, right? In the, in the context of what? Of pictures. pictures. Okay. Pictures, yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but, but that's, that's why I usually tell people about it. <laughs> just one of the reasons why, I mean, a well done sci-fi sci film is really helpful. Yeah, absolutely, right? Yeah. yeah. As, a, as a thought experiment being done right in front of your eyes. Um, yeah, exactly, yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, thank you. Um, let me see, I've got questions in both the chat and Q&A, so I'm gonna kind of bounce back and forth. That's okay, yeah. Um, Judy wants to know, do you have an intuitive feeling for what vacuum energy is? I don't know. An intuitive feeling, yeah, so, so, so the so for those of you who don't know, um, the vacuum energy is something that for a long, long time in physics was debated. Um, the the classic idea of the vacuum being empty, of space being empty, modulo, you know, there's a hydrogen atom every cubic meter or something, but actual vacuum is empty, is something that we begin to doubt when we started to study what we call quantum field theory. The, the microscopic description of the way the universe behaves. And those of you who want to go read about this on your own, uh, there was proposed an experiment to answer the question, is the vacuum really empty, right? It seems like a silly question to ask, but it's the sort of thing that scientists ask themselves all the time. Is the vacuum empty? We think it is, well, we better go test it, right? And so the experiment is something called the Casimir experiment, okay, or the Casimir effect. And basically the idea was if I take two plates of metal and I put them very close together and I put them in empty space, if the vacuum's empty, the plates will be just fine being near each other. They won't experience any, any kind of attraction. But if the vacuum is not empty, if there is some kind of unseen energy, unseen force, the vacuum energy as we call it, it should produce a slight attraction between the plates. Okay, and so this experiment was famously done in the 70s or 80s. Uh, the only name I can remember associated with it is a guy named Lamoureux, a couple of others whose names I should remember as well. They got the Nobel Prize for this, but they set up the experiment and they measured it. And indeed, the vacuum apparently is not empty. It has some kind of energy in it. 
Okay, and this kind of rocked physicist world, right? We're like, holy smoly, the universe isn't empty. Okay, what, is, what does this mean? What are we going to do with it? Okay, you fast forward to my life, right, in my professional career. And in the early 2000s, we discovered that the universe is full of this unknown substance that we don't know what it is. It's causing the universe to accelerate faster than we expected it to be. We thought the universe was empty. What is this stuff? And we call it dark energy. And that's an entire another talk we can give someday, okay? But, but today, we think, most, most physicists and astronomers think, that the dark energy is whatever it is in the vacuum here that we've been talking about. And a lot of our effort over the last two decades has gone in trying to match what we see in astrophysics with what our colleagues in particle physics see when they, when they look at these, these kinds of experiments that I just described. And so what it is, we don't have any idea what it is. Okay, but we're good scientists. We've measured it and we know it's there. So now we're trying to figure out what it is. Great question. <laughs> Great question, Judy. Thank you for asking that one. That was really cool. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, right. Um, Leonard asks, um, you talked about travel and percentages of the speed of light, but what is the fastest speed we've actually attained for any spacecraft? For humans, uh, so the fastest speed was either, I don't remember which, it's either New Horizons or it was Voyager 1. And if it was New Horizons, it's now slowed down and it's Voyager 1 again. Uh, it's traveling at something like, what is it, 33,000 miles per hour, something like that. So it's that's the fastest anything has gone. That's fast enough to escape the gravitational pull of the sun. And indeed, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, New Horizons, Pioneer 1 and Pioneer 2, or sorry, Pioneer 10 and 11 are all traveling outward and will escape the sun and travel out into the galaxy. But those are the fastest spacecraft ever built by humans. And we didn't actually build rockets to make them go that fast. We had to use the gravity of the planets to propel them up to those speeds. So really, we basically used Jupiter as a booster engine uh, to, to get them up to those speeds and send them, fling them out of the solar system. But as you so well laid out in the first half of this presentation, that is not fast enough. That is not fast enough, not fast. And it, right? It's taken Voyager. Yeah. Voyager right now is about, uh, what is it? Three times farther from the sun than Pluto. And it's taken it 40 years to get there, 35 years to get there, okay? So we aren't even close to the distance to the next star. And it's taken us 45 years just to get out that far. So it's not even close to a fraction of the speed of light. Thank you. Um, uh, Len wants to know, um, can you comment on the person traveling 0.99C, um, how will they will measure time passing on Earth? Won't the traveler see time on Earth passing slower than time on his spaceship? So yeah, so, so the way time dilation works is, 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 you know, you're comparing the clock you're carrying around with you, so your wristwatch, to some clock that you aren't carrying around with you, okay? So, you know, the wristwatch that Grace is wearing in the library sitting back on Earth when you got onto your rocket. Now, there is this kind of long-standing question of how do you know which person gets old, right? Is because something we're taught very early is that speeds are relative, right? I'm traveling by you at half the speed of light. You think I'm traveling, uh, I, or I, sorry, you think I'm traveling by you at half the speed of light. I think you're traveling past me at half the speed of light. And so the, so the question becomes, how does, which clock knows to run slow, okay? And the answer is the clocks absolutely know which one of you is moving and which one of you isn't because one of you had to experience an acceleration to get going, right? Someone had to turn on their rocket or stomp on the accelerator, and that's how the clocks know which one is the one that's running slowly. So we've done experiments where if you take, uh, so, so for, for physicists, clocks are basically subatomic particles. So, you know, particles like um, muons, which have a finite lifetime, you know, they're basically, I create a muon and then how long it takes it to die is a clock. So we can do experiments where we have the particles traveling at the same time. I create two muons and then let them travel. And then I compare their clocks as they're traveling. And what we find is if they're both accelerating, 
then both clocks run at the same rate, even if they're going in different directions. It's only when one is definitely standing still and never puts its foot on the accelerator and another one accelerates, another one starts traveling, that the clocks actually travel, tick at different rates. And that's how the clocks know. They, is, is feeling a force is something that everything in nature recognizes somehow. It's a feature of the laws of nature. And that's how the clocks know which one's going to tick slow. I think that was the question. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I still don't get it. But <laughs> <laughs> That's because relativity is really hard. You're not supposed to get it, Grace. It's okay. Um, there, <clears throat> there are quite a few questions, but I'm only going to take a few because I okay. want Dr. Larson to be able to go outside and look up into the sky. Eat the comment. <laughs> by 8.15, which is just three minutes away from here. Um, so there's a question on gravi gravitational waves, but that's a whole separate presentation, which you actually you did for us, I think, before COVID. So we wouldn't have a recording of it. Um, perhaps there's we can something do it again there. sometime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was really, it was yeah. really cool. So, so in gravitational waves, I think the only thing people need to know, some of you may be familiar with LIGO, uh, which is the observatory that's been detecting gravitational waves. They've been doing upgrades for the last year or so. And I think in May, we're going to start observing again. So you will, in the next year or so, begin to start hearing about new discoveries from LIGO again. And those of you who follow LIGO on social media or get the get the alerts on your phone, that should start happening when we start up again in May. Is there something on your blog about it? Uh, I haven't written anything about LIGO in quite a while. There's a lot on my blog about the first discoveries that we made. So mm -hmm. if you go to my blog and look for LIGO, there's a whole bunch there about LIGO and gravitational waves. Absolutely. Okay. Um, all right. So watch for that one sometime soon, I hope. Um, uh, Michael wants to know, has the Webb telescope shed any light on, on any of the topics that you, that you pursue? Yeah, so, uh, so JWST has just started observing, as many of you know, it's just been observing since summer. The first science papers, uh, I mean, there have been several results announced, but the first science papers are going to start coming fast and furious. Um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, JWST is going to spend a lot of time looking at is distant galaxies. And in distant galaxies, one of the things we're interested in is things like big black holes at the centers of galaxies, like the one that's in the movie Interstellar. So, um, so yeah, there will definitely be things that JWST teaches us about some of these things. Um, as always with big giant telescopes, we discover things we didn't know before. And so there may very well be things that we haven't even imagined that have some bearing on the way we think about gravity and the way we think about black holes and, and all of that sort of thing. But, but black holes are definitely one of the things that it presumably will tell us a lot about so okay okay so good night everybody thank you so much dr larson it's always a pleasure thank you grace bye everyone have a great evening so long.